Patrick and of course Eric for inviting me here to be the uh, activist in residence and um, which was made possible by I believe a grant from Tom Link and family and uh, so I'm very happy to be here to be also with old friends like my color name uh, and uh, other uh, friends mm -hmm. who um, were quite active uh, in the solidarity work around the Philippines in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, yes. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, so in contrast to yesterday, what I'd like to do today is to speak about my broader experience as what is termed a public scholar or public intellectual about some of the quote-unquote lessons I have learned at trying to reconcile the demands of intellectual work with uh, political activism. Uh, let me just say, you know, from the start that I was uh, quite fascinated by social analysis uh, from the very beginning when I came into contact with it during my freshman year in college. I found that rooting human behavior in socialization, social process, and social structure uh, provided an explanatory power that was unmatched by any other approach. At the same time, uh, there was always this side of me that saw value in doing theoretical analysis, not for its own sake, but to provide a guide to shaping social arrangements for the better. And this was way before I encountered Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. Activism was never far from my academic work. While doing my graduate work in sociology at Princeton in the early 70s, I led the takeover of the Woodrow Wilson School as an anti-war activist. Uh, while writing up my dissertation on the counter-revolution in Chile, I was also fully engaged in organizing the anti-Marcos movement in the United States as a cater of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Upon getting my PhD, I left the university to plunge into work as a full-time underground activist and did not rejoin the academy until nearly 20 years later. It was also the, during those years as a full-time activist that I think I did my best analytical work. There are four key lessons I have learned from my experience as a public intellectual. The first is that truths, or certain truths, only become true through action. The second is that to get at the truth, one must sometimes resort to unorthodox, indeed illegal, research methods. The third is that one must accept that there is an inevitable and permanent tension between theory and practice, between thought and action, <coughs> between truth and power. Thinking that this tension can be eliminated is one of the most dangerous illusions of the public intellectual. The fourth relates to my talk yesterday, and this is that the only people you can really trust with political power are those who are ambivalent about it but that these are also the very people who are least capable of entering the necessary political compromises to bring about positive political action. So let us take up the first quote-unquote lesson that truths send, need action to become true. This was perhaps brought home decisively to me by the events in Seattle in late November and early December 99. Uh, to which uh, I was a participant. In the decade prior to Seattle, there were a lot of studies, including United Nations reports, UNCTAD reports, that questioned the claim that globalization and free market policies were leading to sustained growth and prosperity. <coughs> Instead, the data showed that globalization and pro-market policies were promoting more inequality and more poverty and consolidating economic stagnation, especially in the global south. However, these figures remained factoids rather than facts in the eyes of academics, the press, and policymakers, who dutifully repeated the neoliberal mantra that economic liberalization promoted growth and prosperity. The orthodox view expressed ad nauseum in the classroom, the media, and policy circles, exemplified by the writings of Thomas Friedman, was that the critics of globalization were Luddites. 
Then we had the massive anti-globalization demonstrations in Seattle that led to the collapse of the third ministerial, the World Trade Organization. It was not just a ministerial that collapsed, but also a creed that had been believed to be true. After Seattle, the press began to talk about, quote unquote, the dark side of globalization, unquote, about the inequalities and poverty being created by globalization. After that, we had the spectacular defections from the globalist camp, such as those of the financier George Soros, the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, and the star economist Jeffrey Sachs. Then came the widely publicized findings of two independent studies, one by American University professor Robin Broad, published in the Review of International Political Economy, and the other a report by a panel of neoclassical economists headed by Princeton's Angus Deaton and former IMF chief economist Ken Rogoff, showing that the World Bank Research Organization Research Department, the source of most assertions that globalization and trade liberalization were leading to lower rates of poverty and inequality, had been deliberately distorting its data and making unwarranted claims. Way before the financial crisis broke out in 2008, the credibility of neoliberalism and the promise of globalization had been severely eroded. What made the difference? Not so much research or debate, but action. It took the militant anti-globalization actions of masses of people and the spectacular collapse of a World Trade Organization ministerial to translate factoids into facts, into truth. What proved decisive was the conjunction of the massive protests of thousands of protesters in the streets of Seattle and the refusal of developing country delegates at the Sheraton Convention Center to accept any more liberalization of their economies. Truth is not just, quote, there. Truth is completed, made real, and ratified by action. Like Columbus's voyage in relation to the theory of the Earth as a sphere, Seattle was a world historic event that made the truth true. My second vital lesson of public scholarship has to do with research methods. One of the conclusions I have reached is that often, when it comes to analyzing really big issues, our normal, our normal research methods in the social sciences are simply inadequate. They don't work because power is often involved, and the powerful want things to be non-transparent. This became very clear to me when it came to studying the World Bank. Let me take you back to 1975, when I had just finished my PhD at Princeton. At that time, an academic career was something that I had no intention of pursuing. The task at that time was quite clear to me, to overthrow the Marcos dictatorship. I became part of an international network connected to the Philippine underground and a full-time activist. I went to Washington and helped set up an office that lobbied the U.S. Congress to cut aid to the Marcos regime. Soon we realized that in order to do any effective work, we had to look at all the dimensions of U.S. support for the dictatorship. For, for instance, the larger, largest part of U.S. aid to Marcos was channeled through multilateral institutions such as the World Bank. And the problem was that the lack of transparency of the bank meant that we couldn't get any information about bank programs in the Philippines. The only information we got came from sanitized press releases. It became clear that to show what the bank was doing and expose it, we had to get the documents from within the bank itself. At first, we slowly formed a network of informants within the bank. These were acquaintances, quote, liberals with a conscience, unquote. Our work was part of a process of building what was effectively a counterintelligence network, not only within the bank, but also within the State Department and other agencies of the U.S. government. Well, these people started to occasionally bring us documents, but this was a tedious, although necessary, process. The information was not enough, so we thought that it was necessary to resort to more radical means. So my associates and I investigated the patterns of behavior of bank people, and we realized that there were times in the year when there was nobody at the bank. Thanksgiving Day, Christmas, New Year's Day, July 4, Memorial Day. 
On those days, and over a period of three years, we went to the bank, pretending that we were returning from a mission with our ties askew and said that we were just coming from Africa or India, etc. The security guards always asked for our IDs. When we pretended to fumble for them, since we looked so tired, they said, okay, just go inside. It always worked. As you can imagine, security was not quite tight in those days. Well, once we were inside, we were like kids let loose in a candy store. We took as many documents as we could, and not just reports in the Philippines, and photocopied them using the bank facilities. <laughs> this happened over three years. The documents, some 3,000 pages of them, on practically every bank supported project and program in the Philippines, provided an unparalleled look at the workings of a close relationship between two non transparent authoritarian institutions, the World Bank and the Marcos regime. First, we held press conference to expose us, to expose the documents piece by piece to the embarrassment of both the bank and the Marcos government. Eventually, we came out with a book published in 1982 by Food First entitled Development Debacle, the World Bank in the Philippines. According to many people, this book contributed to the unraveling of the Marcos regime. I hope they were right. Sorry for the key lessons here. Okay, this was Seattle, and this was uh, development back. Um, as for what I had learned, well, it was that accepted or orthodox methods have their limitations, and that to really do effective research, sometimes you need to break the law. But you have to be very professional in the process. We were quite careful in going about it, and we were not able to tell the real story until about, about how we got the documents until 10 years later, 1992, when the statute of limitations for criminal prosecution in the United States had lapsed. My associates and I could have gotten 25 years in jail had we been caught breaking into the bank, though of course good behavior would have shortened that jail stint <laughs> with an early parole. But on a more serious note, the decision we had to make was not easy. It's never easy to decide to break the law, not only because of the penalties involved, because we are, but because we are also deeply socialized to follow the law. Civil disobedience is one thing. This was theft, repeated theft, well-planned, repeated heist. But we felt that we had no choice. Otherwise, the truth would have been buried for a long, long time in the vaults of the World Bank. The third lesson concerns the tension between analysis and action, between truth and politics. Managing this relationship is not easy, since our moral side is very demanding, especially when it comes to dealing with unpleasant truths. I first experienced being caught between divergent demands of truth and politics when I was doing my PhD dissertation. Um, in 1972, I started my doctoral research on the topic of political organizing in shantytowns in Santiago, Chile, during a revolutionary period. At that moment, I felt a great deal of sympathy for Salvador Allende's government and its so-called peaceful road to socialism. In fact, I think that this was the moment when I became a progressive. However, after three months in the shantytowns, I realized that the country was experiencing not a profound revolution, but a rising counter-revolution. Allende's revolution was already beleaguered. At that point, I felt that if I was to do relevant research, both politically and intellectually, then it was important to study the counter-revolution. So I shifted my dissertation topic to the dynamics of counter-revolution and ended up interviewing middle-class right-wing people who couldn't understand why a brown-skinned person like me was asking them questions about Allende and the government. Often, they were really hostile. I was nearly beaten up twice. Some thought that I was a Cuban agent, and they pointed to the left-wing newspapers that I was foolishly carrying around with me, along with the more conservative newspapers. They laughed angrily and told me to get lost, and I explained I needed to follow what both sides were thinking. 
By mid-1972, it was clear that these people, many of them young affil people affiliated with the youth wing of the Christian Democratic Party, controlled the streets of Santiago, something that I thought was similar to what had happened earlier in fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Eventually, I finished my research and returned to Princeton and got involved in solidarity work against the Pinochet dictatorship after the September 1973 coup. By then, I was both an activist and an engaged intellectual trying to understand class conflict in revolutionary times. The thesis titled The Roots and Dynamics of Counter Revolution, Revolution and Counter Revolution in Chile ended up as a comparison of the counter revolutionary role of the middle class in Chile in 71 to 73 and in Italy and Germany in 19, 1920s. Two politically inconvenient truths, to borrow Al Gore's words, became quite clear to me while doing this dissertation. First, contrary to the prevailing explanations of, on the coup, which attributed Pinochet's success to US intervention in the CIA, I found that the counter-revolution was already there prior to the US destabilization efforts, that it was largely determined by internal class dynamics, and that the Chilean elites were able to connect with the middle class actors terrified by the prospect of poor sectors rising up with their agenda of justice and equality. In short, the US intervention was successful because it was inserted into an ongoing counter-revolutionary process. CIA destabilization was just one of the factors, not the decisive one. This was not something that progressives wanted to hear then, since many wanted a simple black and white picture, that is, that the overthrow of Allende was orchestrated from the outside by the United States. The second related but equally politically inconvenient truth that came out in the thesis was the role of the middle class. Among both liberals and progressives at the time, it was common to portray the middle class as an ally of the working class and the lower classes generally, and to consider that it was by and large a force for democratization. Seymour Martin Lipset's political man had a great deal to do with it, as did the politics of the United Front that was so dear to Marxism-Leninism. My thesis showed that contrary to the assumption, this assumption, the middle classes were not necessarily forces for democratization in developing countries. In fact, when the poorer classes were being mobilized with a revolutionary agenda, the middle classes could become a mass base for counter-revolution, as in Germany and Italy in the 1920s, when the middle class provided the foot soldiers of the fascist movements. But progressives really have a hard time accepting this characterization of the middle class. And part of the subliminal reason is that this is often the class they come from. In fact, years later, I had to restate my position in a review of Naomi Klein's best-selling book, The Shock Doctrine. Naomi is a good friend, but her portrayal of the overthrow of Allende as a product of a plot between the military and the Chicago boys, an alliance without a mass base, is not only simplistic but wrong. It would be like saying that the coups against Taksin Shinawat in Thailand in September 2006 and his sister Ying Lak in 2014 were solely the product of a conspiracy between the military and some people in the Royal Privy Council, without reference to the role of the Bangkok middle classes in creating the political conditions for the coup. Like the Thai middle class in the case of Taksin, the Chilean middle class was instrumental in the overthrow of Allende. It is the role of the public intellectual to point out such truths, truths that are not convenient from the point of view, sometimes, of one's politics. The tension between truth and politics becomes greatest when the public intellectual is part of a political organization. What happens when the demands of truth and the demands of the organization begins to diverge? This has been the greatest fear of intellectuals of the left, for, as I said, our moral or political side is very demanding. In the interest of the bigger battle against the right, against reaction, against imperialism, it is a very great temptation to ignore, rationalize, and defend abuses committed by our sides and to close ranks. In the late 1980s, news started filtering out from the Philippines countryside that the Communist Party, to which I then belonged, had carried out a wide-ranging purge of caters that involved widespread wholesale executions. 
I was so perturbed that I investigated the matter after I re returned to the Philippines in the late 1980s. What I found was truly disturbing. The party had undergone a process of self-immolation that involved the execution of some 2,000 cadres on suspicion of being agents of the military. I interviewed both victims and executioners. The study that I came out with was, for a long time, the only work done on the episode. It was intended to be part of a process of internal reform within the party that would include the internalization of individual human rights and the institutionalization of a system of impartial, objective justice. Instead, I was labeled a uh, Gorbachevite, whatever that meant then. And later on, I was considered an out-and-out counter-revolutionary. That I continued to view and struggle against U.S. hegemony and neoliberal policies as the main obstacles to the Philippines' uh, economic and political development was of no account. I was now, quote-unquote, objectively an agent of U.S. imperialism. I felt I was in good company, though, since one of the figures I have most admire, admired, Nikolai Bukharin, was during the Moscow trials in 1937 also judged to be, quote, objectively an agent of Nazi Germany. I eventually left the party, for it turned out to be very different from the organization that I had joined in 1974. Now, my experience is not unique. Engaged intellectuals at other periods and in other circumstances have found themselves coming to the same juncture when they have to make a decision on whether to toe the line or break with an organization or even a movement. They often come to the point when they realize that they must either stick with the movement despite its abuses because its ends are worthy or break with it because they believe that the objective of change cannot be divorced from the process of achieving it. That is the moment of truth when finally they have to decide whether to be faithful to the party or remain faithful to their role as critical and engaged intellectuals. It is not an easy choice, and one is never certain that one has made the right decision. And certainly, one finds it difficult to be judgmental of those who have gone the other way. Intellectual work and political work are complementary, but they also exist in tension with each other. Living this tension is the grand challenge, and in my view, one of the engaged intellectuals' worst mistakes is to subordinate truth to power in the belief that this is the best route to justice. One needs power to realize truth and to bring about a more just order, but one cannot allow truth to be ensnared by power in the process. I do not have 100% certainty that I have made the right choices. Indeed, my adversaries, and unfortunately I have quite a few, ranging from the World Bank and the WTO to the Philippine military, the Communist Party, and lately the Aquino administration that I was earlier allied with, are betting that I have not, and that I will have my comeuppance, hopefully in the near future. In this regard, someone once said that one of the certainties about being an engaged intellectual is that you create more enemies than friends. And may I add, what few new acquaintances you make, like Hugo Chavez, Hamas, and the Hezbollah, are precisely the ones calculated to create even more enemies. Um, I would like to conclude by discussing the fourth key lesson that I have learned as a public intellectual by connecting today's discussion with that of yesterday. And I believe many of you were in the same situation, uh, 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 place yesterday. I will not go back to the case studies, but for me, the key lesson of a progressive's participation in democratic politics is that the only people you can trust with power are those who are ambivalent about it. Yet, those who are ambivalent about power are also those who are congenitally least capable of mastering the art of compromise that is necessary to get progressive legislation and actions through in a representative democracy. They are either too impatient or they cannot stomach the horse trading without which reforms cannot be pushed in liberal democracies, especially in times when the mass movement is weak. This enterprise may be described as one of engaging in twists 
and turns, but keeping the boat on the right course. Here, one must risk not only the hostility of one's enemies, but also the disaffection of one's progressive allies. It also means knowing when to cease compromising and standing one's ground. And it also means being able to discern when the correlation of forces changes so that what was a principled compromise at one period may no longer be one at another phase of the same broad struggle. Combining ambivalence about wielding power with political calculation thus is for me the highest challenge of a public intellectual. It is not surprising that few have been able to master this art. I certainly see myself as still a novice when it comes to it, having had many um, um, problematic experiences. It is so difficult that some people say, well, why don't we just remain outside the arena of representative democracy and simply act as a pressure group, group on politicians? And one of the comments that came out yesterday, why do we not simply remain uh, as a principled opposition, even when we are representatives in Congress, vetoing everything that comes from the administration? I do not think either is a viable approach. We as progressives have no choice. To change the system, we must learn to work the system, but not to be ensnared by it. Thank you very much. Just to follow up on that comment, which is that I, I was sort of asked, I, I, I was asking that question yesterday, not because I actually, I wanted to see what you thought, not necessarily that I believe that's the yeah, case, yeah. But, but, but I should, I would say that, to, I mean, to, to be successful in negotiation in a system requires some sort of compromise. I mean, is it, uh, to be successful, is it really possible to always keep one's principles at the highest level? And I would suggest that it, it, it's not that easy to do that because we have to compromise sometimes to get some, some successes even if it's not exactly where we want to go. And so how can we remain at this sort of high principle position at the same time as we're trying to get things done and being practical and negotiating? I mean, isn't there a tension there that, that, that is in, in, inevitable? Uh, yes, um, definitely I think that tension is there, and there's no easy way around it. Um, I would just like to say first of all is that, um, what are you compromising on? I mean, that has to be really uh, um, 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 studied and analyzed very carefully, uh, and whether it's something very fundamental or something that you could pass off as a tactical compromise. Um, and um, uh, the second thing, as I said, is that depending on what I would call the correlation of forces, for instance, if you have a strong mass movement, uh, what might have been a principled compromise at one stage may no longer be so, uh, because you have the political forces to be able to push through um, the reform uh, without the necessary compromises at one stage. So, um, and... Um, so, the, um, and this is, I think, where, where um, um, those of us, uh, you know, progressives who um, are ambivalent about political power, um, you know, find their difficulties, you know, because um, uh, especially when you move from opposition to becoming part of a coalition, as we did, uh, then, um, it, you know, you, you have to be very careful uh, at each step of the way, which, um, you know, and, and this was something that I uh, tried to illustrate uh, yesterday, because um, it is always so easy to basic, be disaffected by the compromises that are happening, uh, and um, you, you, you do need to you know, to look, look, you know, is this something tactical or is this something fundamental? And that was part of the debate that we went through in the party. Uh, as I said yesterday, just to give a good example of this, is that we had no illusions that 
this was not a progressive um, uh, government, uh, but it had one very central um, agenda uh, on which we joined it, which was the good governance agenda, the anti-corruption agenda. Uh, that was one thing. The second thing is that we felt that there was enough openness within the coalition that we would be able to push through other items in our agenda, like agrarian reform, etc., etc. Um, well, uh, we also knew that um, when it came to the United States, and um, you know that it, it was going to be basically uh, in uh, a kind of uh, uh, positive relationship with the United States. It was not going to adopt anti-imperialist positions. Uh, but we felt that still, given the centrality of the corruption issue in the Philippines, uh, which exercises the whole society, it was worth it. It was a principal uh, effort, uh, our joining the coalition, although we did warn the president that uh, we would, uh, in fact, come out very strongly uh, if he made any moves to compromise with the United States, especially in terms of the, um, the um, uh, deployment of U.S. troops uh, and coming to uh, an agreement with the United States about the deployment of those troops. So this was, these were the different factors that came in. Uh, um, we did not think that um, we would break with him on the issue of when he made the, the decision to enter a treaty with the United States, the economic, uh, the enhanced defense cooperation agreement, uh, which would basically redeploy U.S. troops in the Philippines. We greatly criticized this, but it was, you know, but the anti-imperialist agenda was not a central uh, item in the reason in, in, in our joining the, the coalition. We hoped that we could persuade the president not to enter into this agreement, but we had no illusions about it. However, the good governance thing was something else. I mean, this was the central point. You know, this was the reason we had joined the coalition. And when he broke that promise, when he moved away from good governance and started using double standards, that's when the crisis hit our party. Because the very point on which we had joined the coalition, the president had now backtracked from it. And that's what caused the division. And I found myself in the minority. And since I was the principal representative of the party in Congress, and I could no longer support the president, but the majority continued to support the president, I uh, basically uh, left. So these are the calculations that uh, came in. Uh, and I think that I still made the right decision uh, when drawing what was a principled position okay, against what was an unprincipled one. So this is, you know, sometimes you really have to have, there's no general prescription. No. You really, really have to look at what, what are the issues involved and, um, and um, decide what is a tactical compromise and what is a fundamental compromise that you cannot stomach or something that goes against your values as a progressive. Yes, please. Um, I've been having a hard time with what you described yesterday. That is, how can we have a government where the principled people have to leave? I mean, that leaves us with the power-hungry fascists, right? So I'm thinking, I was thinking uh, contractually, if you were going to form a coalition as you were in, why couldn't you build into that an arbitration process that confronted violations of your agreement as to what the coalition was going to accomplish? And why couldn't we have, as ombudsmen, the individuals who have a moral backbone um, who will um, enforce this kind of an arrangement? It seems to me, otherwise, we are at the, you know, the mercy of the power-hungry fascists. Yes, well, uh, the first thing I would just like to address again is the, uh, 
the first part of your statement, which is, um, again, I was, I was, you know, taken off from a quote by Mario uh, Vargas Llosa yesterday, Absolutely. where he, he comes from a different political end, you know, yeah, yeah, but I think it was very valuable, that the point that he made, that, um, that um, the most successful, or the successful politician is one who is obsessed with power. And that uh, um, people who are not successful, uh, you know, I mean, uh, people who are not obsessed with power cannot be successful politicians. That was the challenge of that quote. Um, I guess what I was trying to say is, you know, I disagree with that, okay? However, I have to recognize the fact that those of us who are ambivalent about power oftentimes, in fact, cannot stomach the kind of uh, working out of compromises, making distinctions between a tactical com compromise and a fundamental compromise, and seeing how the different <coughs> contexts in which things changes so that what might have been a good compromise in year X, given the fact that now you have the mass movement uh, intervening is no longer a principled compromise. So those kinds of uh, uh, distinctions made in the heat of political battle, oftentimes it's very easy to just take a fundamental, a fundamentalist kind of approach and say, this is very dirty and we're not going to engage in it. So that was the, so my point here, which I repeated here, is that I, 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 I think it's difficult but we have no choice but, in fact, to enter the fray. And that, that, that we must realize that, that, um, that even as we're ambivalent about power, we just have to force ourselves to go through this dirty process, quote-unquote, uh, of compromises. Um, and the fact is that most of the time, we don't have a revolutionary situation. Okay? And again, oftentimes what we act on, and in the Philippines, for instance, at this point in time, we have the mass movement at a very low point. But coming to the, to the second point about if you enter a coalition, uh, why don't you have the very formal agreements so that um, um, when those agreements are violated, uh, you can call on an ombudsman or somebody and to, to adjudicate it. I think that's a very, very good idea. Uh, but oftentimes, it's very, very difficult to get coalition partners to agree to such a formal process. And you just have to keep on pushing what you felt was the basis of the coalition. Keep on reminding them about it. Um, and, you know, so you, you end up with this informal give and take most of the time. But yes, if you can do it, if you can have, you know, a sort of formal process with an independent adjudicator, great, you know. Uh, it's just that in the context of political coalitions in a place like the Philippines at this point, it's very difficult to have that kind of formal process that comes out with a formal agreement that's down on paper. Yes. Um, really interesting ideas, which I'm very much in agreement with. Uh, but I don't think, I think it's also an illusion to imagine that in a revolutionary situation, this is any less of a problem. Because you seem to suggest that this was somehow the problem of compromising and the ambivalence towards power, being the only people you could trust, was only true because it's a liberal democracy. I think even if you had a revolutionary situation, you face the same imperatives because the idea that once you have a revolutionary situation, you can be uncompromising and simply ram through the pure form without regard to the necessity of brokering deals with potential counter-revolutionary opposition to do things to, you know, pull back from the full program in order to stabilize and integrate a new social order, um, I think that's an illusion as well. Mm -hmm. That is the crafting of a 
you know, even in our fantasies, so to speak, I don't think we're going to have a revolutionary mm -hmm. situation of that character where that's even on the table, mm -hmm. should we or should we not compromise uh, in, the, in places like the United States. But <clears throat> where that does happen, mm -hmm. the idea that you can um, single-mindedly just push through the pure policy mm -hmm. is also an illusion. And we know the catastrophes that... Yes, I, I, I think I fully admit it. Yeah. If, if I gave the... Uh, impression of romanticizing. So the, so the, the question of the art of compromise yeah. um, is, really needs a lot of theoretical thinking about what we even mean by that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it means there is something that could be called a middle ground between two positions, mm -hmm. and what's needed is mutual compromise. Mm -hmm. That's quite different where what compromise means, I am compromising my values, mm -hmm. I'm basically capitulating, mm -hmm. because I can't forge a middle ground. Mm -hmm. The word compromise gets used in both mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. The ideal of a, of a full board democracy is that, the, that compromising is this mm -hmm. process of mm -hmm. give and take, rather than just give mm -hmm. and no take. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what you felt was that you were forced to capitulate, not compromise. Mm -hmm. That the original engagement was a compromise, that is, you would pull back on your demands around anti-imperialism in order to accomplish something which there seemed to be more of a consensus about. Mm -hmm. And then you were asked to capitulate on that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really, you're being asked to abandon a compromise. Mm -hmm. You were willing to compromise, mm -hmm. but you were being asked to abandon compromise and just capitulate. Yeah. I, I, I fully agree. I mean, I, I should have, you know, I could, those would be terms that I would uh, basically also use. Uh, what I used here was a negative compromise yeah. as opposed to a positive one. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, the, you know I, I, I'm in agreement with you on that. And, and secondly, um, definitely, I mean, uh, the necessity of compromises uh, does not, you know, it's not only in liberal democracies, but including in revolutionary situations, you know, and uh, clearly, you know, um, in revolutionary situations, um, uh, there are maximum programs that, um, you know, that could end up just inflaming the counter-revolution, uh, or you have, you know, programs that, you know, are much, you know, not the maximum program, but certainly still go some way towards meeting some of your mass-based demands, you know, like agrarian reform, you know. Um, so, you know, so, so basically, you know, the same sort of considerations around context, timing, you know, the, you know, is this a positive one or is this a negative one, the correlation of forces, all of those really uh, come into play. So, um, I fully agree that, uh, you know, and, and I, would, I, I would say, it, I guess my only point was that um, when you have the mass movement being quite strong, um, this, the political space opens up a bit more so that your <coughs> demands can be, uh, you know, um, more radical, as it were. Uh, but, but still, uh, the realities of it is that the maximum demand, but that is being demanded by some of your mass base, uh, you really can't push through because it would just create a coalition of forces against you. You know, so the art of compromise then during a revolutionary situation is is you know is guided by the same quote unquote principles of determining that compromise which. Um, is a positive compromise uh, and does not lead to a situation that in fact unites your enemies against you and you know creates a big counter revolution so you know this is this is I guess some of the nuances that I've been trying to bring friend thanks for thanks for uh, giving that you know that intervention yes it seems to me that that in sort of framing these questions through reflections on uh, on your life and your political decisions, that you're not really talking about the question of compromise and negotiations for political organizations. You're really talking about the question of 
engagement for a public intellectual who's always a part, never completely committed to any organization, uh, you know, has an eclectic mix of views, takes, basically takes his own path. I mean, you know, you, whether, whether you're, <coughs> you're studying Chile and telling the leftists that they're all wrong about the fundamental causes of the coup, or I, I don't even want to imagine how you, how you manage to interview both sides during a purge of the Communist Party and still survive. Um, but you've always so it, it, for for you when your when when your party uh, made the wrong principal decision in terms of what were the what was the basis of uh, being in a coalition for you you withdraw from the party you withdraw from from that in, entire position uh, for most people I think in most countries uh, political uh, engagement and even the formation of political <coughs> views is fundamentally bound up with membership in a specific organization or group or community. Uh, and I think one of the, the weaknesses of, of activism in the United States is that so much of it is on the individualist model and so much of it is people who say, basically in a sort of consumerist way, I won't, I won't engage in this organization, this campaign, unless it meets all of my criteria, unless it uh, suits itself completely to me, and the, the best thing is to remain apart and pure rather than to make any sort of compromise. So, so if, if, you, if you could talk about, uh, it seems to me that for, that for mo most people don't have the sort of wherewithal to come up with their, their own views independently of an organization, come up with their own <coughs> make modes of engagement consistently over decades, remaining sort of politically relevant while still being clearly not beholden to any organization. Could you, what exactly do you learn from, from your own experiences that can apply to this more general question of, of how, how to yeah. work in an organization? Well, I would fundamentally disagree with you, okay? Uh, one of the first, you know, one of the first things one has to recognize is where you're coming from. And, you know, I, you know, um, I will, you know, the first thing that one has to recognize is one's placement, um, social class-wise, and in terms of the stratum that you come from. And that one comes from what we call in the developing countries, the intelligentsia. And um, that's the first thing. Uh, and um, coming from that sector, you do have certain responsibilities, you know, um, with respect to uh, other people, um, in the mass movement, you know, who uh, might not have had the same kind of experiences that you've had uh, in terms of, you know, analytical training, you know. And um, so that's, that's, that's the second thing. I think there's a responsibility uh, to be able to relate to other people bringing, you know, what you were fortunate enough to have acquired uh, uh, in the process of creating social change. The third thing is, um, um, I was with the Communist Party for 14 years, you know, and um, in most of that time, uh, there was a lot of struggle and discussions, uh, wrong lines, um, 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 uh, and you know, you had to be um, part of a process whereby you had to articulate certain positions, but you also had to um, live up to certain disciplinary standards. You know, um, so um, so I would I I would say that um, that even as you're part of an organization, I think your critical faculties continue to be exercised as when you fight for a position where you absolutely say no, or where you basically say, well, I'm not too clear about our position here, uh, and I will live with, with that until things become much clearer. And um, when, um, <clears throat> when the um, uh, situation uh, of uh, the executions took place, okay, 2,000 people, this is the first communist party in the world in which the purge of combatants took place before, quote unquote, the seizure of power. Okay. Um, that's where I drew the line, 
okay? Uh, and here, it was very important that there has to be an objective justice system and that this whole issue of human rights, um, the rights of the individual had to be brought in because there's just this thing you know, in the traditional Leninist parties whereby only classes had rights, okay? And the most rights belong to the cadre, the intelligentsia that was leading the party, the whole tradition of Lenin. So I think that that was the kind of um, 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 uh, um, atmosphere that I was struggling against in a very real context whereby people had been um, had been executed. You know. So um, with the Akbayan, uh, I was one of the founders of the party since 1998. So. Basically, we had the same kind of processes going on. Uh, it was Akbayan had had um, broken. Many of us had broken with the Communist Party uh, to embrace a democratic socialist model, okay? and uh, which made us very open to working within the system uh, with different political forces, so long as we we could push through uh, gradually a progressive agenda. So this was the 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 so this was the context in which I was drawing lessons. I I I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, but I certainly was not you know a footloose intellectual that was basically uh, picking and choosing what I would agree with. There were a lot of things that uh, I lost. There were a lot of debates I lost. Okay, uh, but still stayed with the party. So, um, and I think that, um, um, again, coming back to the original position, uh, uh, I think that, you know, different people within a mass progressive organization come from different places, they have certain different things to contribute, and certainly as somebody coming from the middle class intelligentsia that had been radicalized, there were certain things that I brought which, you know, was, you know, I was going to share analytically, you know, with other members of the organization. And that's, uh, I, I think your criticism would be valid if I were just a footloose intellectual that was picking and choosing. But, as I said, I was 14 years in the, in the Communist Party, and then for the last, uh, since 1998, I was a disciplined member of the um, uh, Citizens Action Party. So I would say that that um, um, that I, I would say that um, my experience uh, would. I'm not exactly sure about what you meant by the experience of progressives in the states, but I certainly am not going to speak about that now. But I just wanted to make clear that there was a history and a context to the lessons that I was uh, bringing uh, forward. It wasn't a criticism. I just think that, that public intellectuals like you have the option of exit from an organization while remaining engaged with the political issues and, and movements that, that, that animate you in a way that, that uh, ordinary or other members of such movements don't have. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, let, let me put it this way. Um, um, to some extent, yes, but um, if you're part of a political party or a political grouping and you have a live debate, you know, whether it's a communist grouping or a democratic socialist grouping, is that the important thing is to activate the process of debate within the party and try to win that debate. I have not exited from a bias. Okay. I am going to win that debate within the party, and I'm going back to win that debate. Uh, and um, what that means is you, you launch a struggle within the organization about where it should be going. I, um, um, let me just say that I guess I'm in a process of a retreat at this point in time, um, and thanks to Eric, okay? and I hope that I regain the energies <laughs> 
for what is going to be a major debate, because I think, you're, uh, I think one of the implications of your point is really important, which is that we cannot just be establishing one organization after another. We cannot just be saying, oh, this has failed, it has not met you know, my, my conditions, um, and I'm going to exit and form another organization. And that's, unfortunately, in, in, in many places, uh, in, in developing countries, um, that's what happens. But that's not what I intend to do. In fact, uh, people have constantly been asking me, why don't you leave the party? Why don't you leave the party? And I say, well, the, the quick thing that I just give the press is that, no, I mean, I helped found this party in 1998. I would be crazy to leave it, okay? But, uh, but definitely, um, I would be against a process whereby uh, if you lose a struggle, you just say, forget it, you know, I'm leaving, you know. And that certainly would not be the way, yeah, it's not the way that I've been approaching the current uh, struggle that I've been having with, with, uh, with members of my party. But thanks for the question.